Okay, so here's what's really cool. Is this too loud? No, okay. What's really cool is today is the day that we are finally, eventually, today, we're going to start getting into the actual covenants. Really, really cool, right? How many remember, so we can do a little bit of a mini quiz, but one of the first questions that I asked when we began was, how many covenants do you think are in the Bible? And I got mixed answers. Based on scholars, academic scholarship, how many covenants are in the Bible? Five, Five right? Good. That ingrained in your head. So we're going to get there. Now, we had briefly, in the very first lesson, we had talked a little bit about how the Bible was formed, how the books in the Bible came together. And I briefly had mentioned just a little bit about um, chronology and just how you know, things can get confusing, and then we dove into how we got the books of the Bible. Before we ultimately jump right into actual covenants, we do need to make sure that we understand chronology just a little bit more. And the reason being is because if you have an approach to reading the Bible that just simply says the Bible is just... Uh, whatever, and we joked about some of the, what we call it, it's the word, it's basic instructions before leaving earth, you know, father's love letter. If you just take it from beginning to end, in its fullness is everything all lumped up together, we can misconstrue the heart of God because things just start not making sense. And the chronology in the Bible doesn't help at all. Okay, so if we were to organize the Old Testament, all right, the Old Testament could basically be broken down into four main areas, all right? You're going to have history, you're going to have poetry, you're going to have your major prophets, and then you're going to have your minor prophets. Okay, and in each of these categories, you basically have Genesis all the way through Esther is history. You have Job, in the, to the, not Joe, Job, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, Solomon. yep. In poetry, your major prophets are going to start with Isaiah and go all the way through Daniel. And then your minor prophets are going to be Hosea to Malachi. Okay. You want to have me dance? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get the books of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. No, that's okay. So, so we could look at this and say, all right, so that's basically how most Bibles are set up. Um, they're set up by categories, okay? But if, as we begin to understand how the covenants were laid out through the revelation of God, through the continuing and growing revelation of God to people, and how it's his covenant journey with mankind, these things start to get a little bit messed up. And here's why. So if you were to, I'm, I'm not, well, should I write this on the board? Okay. Um, from Genesis, I'm going to draw a line here so you don't get confused. From Genesis all the way to 2 Samuel. It is uh, pretty much straightforward history. All right? That's cool. Totally fine. And we can all follow that, right? You start with Genesis, creation, the fall, the flood, recreation, Abram, 
Abraham, and you continue going through that. Then you have the Exodus, you've got Moses, they go out, they're in the wilderness for 40 years, making all kinds of dumb mistakes. Then they get to the promised land, and in between the wilderness and the promised land, the law comes in, and then you have the Leviticus laws, you have Deuteronomy, you have Numbers. Then you start getting into lots of other history with, um, with Samuel. But then you get Kings and Chronicles. Anybody have any idea well, first of all, let's do this. What are the similarities between First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles? Anybody have any idea? The Chronicles were written um, either after they were in captivity, and therefore they have more uh, positive outlook than the Kings. Interesting. What else? It's an interesting concept too. Yeah, absolutely. What are the, um, have you ever read your Bible and you read something in Kings and then it has a footnote and it says you can read basically the same story in Chronicles? Okay, absolutely. Um, I'm going to share this Bible in a second, but I have a Bible that even explained it as such that Kings was... Uh, kind, kind of very similar to what you said, that Kings was more of a perspective from the historian that tried to support the kings and their decisions and even their failures, but try to look at it from their point of view as far as what was happening. And Chronicles was more of the priestly account of what was taking place. But you still have similar things However, sometimes you can read stories and they kind of conflict each other, not in overall description of what happened, but when you get to like actual numbers, like how many people died or how many years it took for something to take place or what year it was. If you read the same stories, sometimes you get discrepancies. And the reason why you have discrepancies is simply because it was based on who the author was. So it's important for you to know that because if you have anybody who wants to challenge you on saying the Bible, the word of God is not accurate, it conflicts itself, sometimes those are the things that they're talking about. And it all depends on who you are, who, not who, but it all depends on uh, what history is being used to substantiate the writings. Um, but this can get confusing because you'll have 1 Kings and then 2 Kings, and then you'll get to Chronicles, and it kind of like goes back, right? So if you can even think of this as a timeline, and this is creation, right? And then this is, I'm just going to put 70 AD on here. All right, cross somewhere here, right? So... From creation moving forward, everything starts to make sense until you get to kings. And then it's like you go forward, and then you go back, and then you go forward. So you've, right there, you've got some chronology problems. It's like you could almost stack kings and chronicles on top of each other on that timeline. You could, yeah. Sort of. You could, yeah, exactly, in a way. Uh, so Chronicles, story of the kings, some similar, and it's basically telling of Israel and Judah. Now you have to remember the 12 tribes ended up separating and you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom was basically Judah. The northern kingdom was basically Israel. So it talks about how both Israel and Judah at different times ended up going into exile, whether it's um, um, Babylonian exile or Assyrian exile. After that, then you come Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, what happens with Ezra and Nehemiah is a huge jump forward. And you don't have any idea what happened because you know in Kings and Chronicles, it's talking about 
these battles that they have and then Israel is taken captive and you see the battles where the Babylonians come to take Judah captive and you don't really know what's going on with the story, but Ezra and Nehemiah are way up here somewhere in the timeline because they're talking about we're back. Well, how did they get back? And how was Jerusalem destroyed? And how did the temple get destroyed? What are you talking about? So if you just instantly just grab Ezra, Ezra or through Nehemiah and start reading, it's, it's jumbled because you've got a huge gap that takes place there. Then what do you get after Nehemiah? Your Bible probably has Job. Now, if you were here a couple years ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, when Bob spent several Sundays over and over again talking about how Job was written before all of the five covenants, right? Where would Job be placed if you were going to put it in history? <laughs> well, not quite before Genesis, but it would be before, let's say we want to put um, Noah and the flood. All right. A lot of scholars would put him as a contemporary of Noah, or not before the flood, but it, well, it depends on how you want to read it. It could be before the flood, it could be after the flood. But he was definitely a contemporary of Noah, so a lot of people want to say that he's before the flood. So if he's before the flood, now what do you have? You have the, all the story of, you know, Moses and Abraham and Noah, and then you've got, you know, we don't want judges, we want kings, and you have kings, and you've got Samuel, and you've got David, and you've got all this stuff that's going on, and they're about to go into captivity, and whew, now you've got to jump in like, we're back, we're back into captivity. You read Ezra and Nehemiah, and then you get to Job, and it's, whew, it's before any of those covenants, and we haven't even talked about those covenants yet. It goes way back in time. And it does a disservice when people start reading the book of Job. There's two challenges you can have with Job. If you just simply take a scripture out of Job, you might think that that's God speaking, when in reality, you need to read Job as an entire book. And that's a challenge, because it's not the easiest book in the world to read, but if you just take a scripture out of the book of Job, you could be quoting one of the friends that's completely missed the whole point and is wrong about his opinions of who God is and how he operates. So if you just pick a scripture and it says, you know, because God is this and that's your life verse, <laughs> well, that could be problematic. The second thing is, is you get into problems when you start understanding covenant. And this will all make sense when we get there. But when you start trying to say that you follow a system of blessing and curses, where if you do this and please God, you will be blessed. But if you do this, you will be cursed. If that is the approach to your relationship with God, you could take Job and see some of the things that he's saying and agree with all of his friends. But that covenant didn't even exist yet. That was a completely foreign concept. So if we have them recorded, I would encourage you to go back and listen to Bob's messages on Job because he did a fantastic job explaining how we're not in that situation. And this doesn't mean we take something like the book of Job and throw it away, no. All scripture is useful for teaching and rebuking, but um, we can learn from Job and see how God actually still operated despite there not being any covenants that had been established. So you've got that situation. So, so far we've done this. Yep, 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 yep. Whoa, yep, over here. Whoa, now we're back over here. See what I'm saying? The chronology of the Bible is whacked. Um, all right, so then you get to Psalms. Who wrote the Psalms? David wrote the Psalms. Who else wrote some Psalms? <laughs> A bunch of people wrote some Psalms, right? You have lots of people who have written Psalms 
from different time periods with different covenants that are in place. So even grabbing a psalm, we want to try to know who wrote it. Unfortunately, some psalms we really don't know who wrote. But if we know who wrote the psalm, we can then say to ourselves, for those who haven't been in some of the other classes, some of the questions that we all ask ourselves when we're reading scripture is to use an inductive process. And an inductive process is to ask questions such as, who is speaking? When did it take place? What are the circumstances? Who, what, where, when, why? And then the last one is how. How, how did they get there? How do we you interpret this, what's going on, so it's an inductive process. So Psalms can be confusing. Uh, and then you have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, I'm just going to put ECC, and then Song of Songs. Now these poetry type pieces are great. Um, these are uh, basically written by Solomon before going into exile. So, again, we've got our time period. You get a huge jump to get to, let's rebuild everything. Job, this is before the flood. Psalms, I might be here, I might be here, I might be here, I might be here. You get to Proverbs, it's all before, uh, you know, exile. It's all before, you know, the, the rest of the kings that kind of brought on lots of big problems. And then you get to Isaiah through Ezekiel. I'm going to jump up here. Just Isaiah through Ezekiel. Now, Isaiah through Ezekiel, these are major prophets. And what are they prophesying? Anybody know what they're, they're basically prophesying? What are, if you were to lump it into like one, and it's tough. Huh? You want to say end of times? Okay. Basically, these prophets are all contemporaries of the kings in the Chronicles, and they are prophesying destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of Israel is coming, and you are going to be carried away. They were prophesying the captivity. They were prophesying the exile. That's what they were prophesying. So again, now we're back. We're, we're going back and forth. So we went through Kings and Chronicles and we had all of this stuff where you're going like this and this. And then you get to the major prophets and you've got to figure out, well, which king are they talking to at this point? And sometimes they will say, it'll say, Isaiah had this word for this king. And you would then have to go back and find well, what was going on because this is history. Kings and Chronicles is all history. So you got to know what's, what's taking place at that moment. Who is it? Uh, and it's really weird because they're placed technically, if, if you were going to do this on a timeline, you would be saying, well, why was Ezra and Nehemiah back here? Like, there's no reason yet for Ezra and Nehemiah to even be here. Because if they're talking about, yay, we're back in Jerusalem and let's rebuild it. We've come back from captivity. Why didn't the people who made our Bible, our canon, just put that at the end of all of the prophecies? Well, it's because of this. It's because they decided to put the Bible in these categories. So then after Ezekiel, then you get to Daniel. And Daniel is the last major prophet. And Daniel is interesting because he is actually in exile. So he's in Babylonia exile, and he is foretelling a return to the land. He's, he's basically prophesying what Ezra and Nehemiah are actually living. These folks are living in the return to Jerusalem that Daniel prophesied. And then you've got some minor prophets. You've got Hosea through Zephaniah, right? And Hosea through Zephaniah, 
they are basically prophesying a similar doom of captivity that the major prophets did. So they're similar. They're doing the same thing that these guys are doing. They're prophesying destruction is coming. You're going to be taken captive. Your city is going to be torn down. You're going to be taken into exile. Whether it's you first Israel or you, O oh Judah, you're not going to be spared. You're going to have the same fate that Israel did. And then you get to the final end and you have Haggai. Basically, Haggai through Malachi, right? And what are these folks doing? They're foretelling um, the rebuilding of a coming greater glory. So these three specifically, they're prophesying something that's wonderful that is yet to come. Something that has never been seen before. So you can kind of see here with this convoluted mess that I put up here that this causes challenges for us if we were going to try to understand the heart of God and where he's coming from, okay? If we don't understand the covenant that is in effect at that moment in time, then we're going to get confused if we just start randomly grabbing a book and quoting it and not understanding what's taking place at that moment. Where in history are we? Just because it's near the end of the Old Testament doesn't mean chronologically it's closer to Jesus. Does not mean that at all. And just because you're in the center doesn't mean in your middle, like if you're reading Job, because that's actually all the way back in Noah's day. So it causes some challenges and some, some, uh, some confusion. Now, I will say that um, if you have the book, Dr. Welton will go into describing his preferences if he were to create a Bible. He says that um, he may be interested in making that a project, like to create the, the Welton Academy version of the Bible, not a new translation, but just a new order of putting them in there. So if you have the book, you can go ahead and take a look at that. Um, he has some mixed reviews about chronological Bibles because it's all subject to interpretation, for one. But two, a chronological Bible is not really that useful for overall everyday study. Because usually when you're going to study, we prefer that you read the entire book so you know everything that's taken place. But if you're so inclined, I really like this. Now, I, I'm going to pass this around. Please don't lose my bookmark because this is a chronological Bible and I am reading this in order. This is really cool because it puts things in chronicle, chronological order. So you'll read, especially in this area, you might read about a, a, a story of history, a part of history from the king's perspective. Then you'll read it from the chronicle's perspective. And then you might read some psalms that are related to it. I might even jump to a minor or a major prophet around that time. So you're going from book to book to book and you're all reading about the same story, which is really, really neat. So you can't say, you know, Isaiah is from page, you know, 672 to, you know, 820. It's not going to be like that. It's all over the place as you start reading. So um, even in the, uh, the, the New Testament, it's still kind of that way. And it's not only is it a chronological Bible, and I'll pass this around so you can take a look at it, but it's also uh, kind of like an archaeological study Bible too. So it'll give you little stories about different artifacts or what something meant. You know, when they said that they were going to use this item, they would give it, it gives you descriptions of how they used that item and why. Or if it talks about a god that is a, you know, a god that the Canaanites worshipped or somebody of that nature, it'll explain who that is and what festivals that they, they had for that God and some of the things that they did just try to put stuff into some historical, contextual understanding. It's, it's really cool. All right. Are we ready for me to erase this? Yeah? Did you bring your kids? You did. Okay, cool. Because we do have child care, which is pretty sweet. Right under, <laughs> the right under your seat. <laughs> 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 
So um, here's another re- thing that makes some things uh, difficult when it comes to understanding things. Let's, let's talk just for a brief second about the time span of the, of, of the Bible and then how that relates to the New Testament because we only did the Old Testament there. Just the book of Genesis alone, if you were to count all the years that are referenced with all of the genealogies and whatnot, just the book of Genesis is almost 2,500 years of time just in that one book alone. All right? Now, the rest of the Old Testament... How many years do you think the rest, the entire rest of the Old Testament is? Anybody want to guess? Hmm? 9,000 in the old, in the, for the rest of the Old Testament? Thirteen hundred years for the rest of the Old Testament. Okay. Now, the New Testament. We're not too worried about the um, chronology of the New Testament because it's so little time. The chronology of the New Testament and what took place, if you want to say that we're beginning with Jesus' ministry, if we're not talking about the birth of Jesus and then he began his ministry at about the age of, what they say, like 30 Okay, if you take that out, the New Testament is basically about 40 years. Now, in comparison, um, the New Testament has the most number of books because they're such short, you know, books. So this is a lot of time, right? 3,500 years of time packed into the Old Testament, it kind of uh, just just puts things into perspective of uh, how much change in culture can influence everyday life. We look at our own culture, right? Is our culture today different than um, our grandparents' culture? I would say, yeah, absolutely. The, the biggest thing that comes into perspective really is, is um, technology. Technology and machinery are, are the biggest things. But that does put a whole different spin, you know, on culture, everyday life. You know, it wasn't uncommon for people to not have, like lots of people, especially if you lived outside of the city, to not have electricity, to not have running water, to take you know, a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, and put them in a tub out in the backyard, and that's where they took their baths. I mean, it's like that type of a culture right there, and that's just in the span of less than 100 years, right? So how much changes in culture do you think took place over 3,500 years? Lots of changes in culture. So when we say things like God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is. His character never changes. His covenants do. His covenants change. But more importantly, people's understanding of God changes. People's culture changes. We were joking about idioms. Idioms change, you know. Uh, Meanings of words change. So now... I want to point out that um, when I say the New Testament is roughly 40 years, okay, uh, there's a reason for this, and, and that's because one of the biggest prophecies that Jesus ever gave was the destruction of Jerusalem. So if you read Matthew 24, you're going to hear the apostles are at the beginning of it say that, you know, as they walked away and... Uh, you know, Jesus had just said, you know, I tell you the truth, not one stone is going to be remaining. Everything will be destroyed. And they basically, they ask Jesus, they say, you know, well, 
when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And he gives this long drawn out dialogue, all of Matthew 24. And at the end he says, all of this will happen within a generation. Well, historically, in a contextual point of view, a generation basically meant 40 years to that time period. And from the time that Jesus died on the cross to the time that Jerusalem was once and for all totally destroyed, the temple was totally destroyed, no opportunity at all for an old Mosaic covenant to even be executed and done was exactly 40 years. Now, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem so accurately, not just in the synoptic gospels with his um, uh, Olivet Discourse, if you want to call it that, but even John's book of Revelation so completely reveals the, um, the destruction of Jerusalem that many scholars try to date these books well past it. But the only defense that they have is that it's too good to be true. It's too accurate for it to be true. You look at some scholars that have actually done an excellent job at reviewing certain books. I had mentioned before Kenneth Gentry, his doctorate. I think that was actually called Before Jerusalem Fell. Um, to this day has been undisputed. Nobody can counter any of the things that he has to say about the dating of the book of Revelation as compared to what happened with Jerusalem. Another one is John A.T. Robinson. These are scholars that have unequivocally proven that the books of the New Testament, all of them, have been written before 70 A.D. Uh, so again, chronology is not as important with the, um, the New Testament, but that Bible, it still doesn't, because it is kind of neat, especially when you look at the book of Acts. You know, you look at the book of Acts and you have all these different stories that are taking place and Paul's writing letters to churches that he's established in the book of Acts. So you can read what took place and then you can read his letter back to them, you know, and, and, and things like that, which is, which is pretty neat. As a matter of fact, on a uh, timeline basis, the book of James is probably the earliest um, post-gospel book if you really want to think about it. So Paul didn't even really have a chance yet to completely lay out his faith message you know, that uh, really defended the grace of God um, when James wrote his book, which is still completely valid. James' points are excellent, um, but um, they are kind of contrasting if you want to think of it that way. And Paul had a different uh, message that he was bringing out, but that was after James. All right. So that's just a little bit about chronology. We just wanted to finish that up. Everything that we've done to this point is really talking about Bible study methods. Um, we talked a lot about how you read the Bible, biblical theology versus systematic theology. Uh, historical context. So the things that I want you to you know, remember, if, if you take anything away from the class, remember when you're reading your Bible, first of all, covenant. The Bible from beginning to the end is, is God's written account of his covenant journey with mankind. And you want to put into your head that we need to make sure that we use a historical, contextual hermeneutic. And a hermeneutic is simply a, it's, by definition, a science of interpretation. It's how we interpret the Bible. I was recently reading how uh, you throw the word theology. I like to study theology. And many people have told me that they don't study theology. They just read the Bible. They just read the Bible and they just let the Holy Spirit speak to them and guide them into all truth. And I say, amen. That's absolutely great. Basically, what you're doing is you're coming up with your theology. You're studying God based on your understanding. You're allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and the Holy Spirit does speak to us, and you are formulating your theology. And you're adding to formulation of your theology by sitting in church and listening to a preacher 
explain the word of God the way that they seem fit, and it forms your theology. So everybody studies theology. Everybody has a theology. Everybody really does. So, but we talked about filters. We talked about dispensationalism and Calvinism, and these filters uh, have their own share of challenges because when you start reading the Bible biblically, uh, trying to make things fit into those systems, they start to not work. So we're going to talk about the five major covenants now. Yay, it took two and a half classes to get here. Five major covenants in the Bible. Now, that surprises some people because all you've really heard of is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it also may shock some people to hear that not everything in the Old Testament is Old Covenant. And not everything in the New Testament is New Covenant. You have a lot of things that are going back and forth there. Some of the confusion comes into play where, for the most part, when the word old covenant is used, they're actually speaking of one main predominant covenant, which was the Mosaic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant was the covenant where the law was given. And the law, over that period of time, that 3,500 years, the law was basically in effect as a covenant from Mount Sinai forward, okay? So, but let's talk about what is a covenant. So, what, do you, what, what does the word covenant mean to you? It's an agreement. It's an agreement. What else? A promise. It's a promise. Say that again. Okay. It, yeah, it sets up your relationship with the parties. Uh huh. And you said. A binding. It's binding. Yeah. So it's not like a mortgage. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a binding contract with a relationship where I have to do this, and if not, they're going to take my house away if I don't pay. But there's a couple parts about. A covenant. First of all, a covenant is between two parties. It can be compared to marriage. Marriage is a covenant. That is exactly right. What type of covenant a marriage is, we'll get to later. Because there are different types of covenants, but that's for next week's class. I'm not going to go too much into that. Um... A covenant, it was written and it was signed. All right? It was legal and binding. And the last thing that we don't really think about too much is that over time, parties would add the canon. So, <clears throat> I'm going to reference this book a couple times. Um, I must have left it in the car. That's too bad. So, um, or no, maybe I brought it for next week. There is a book, I'll bring it next week. There is a book by um, Jonathan Kahn, C-A-H-N, Jonathan Kahn. It's called Kinship by Covenant. Kinship by Covenant is an excellent book. If you're, if you're into academic books that are this thick and a third of it is footnotes, <laughs> okay? If that's what you're into reading, um, Kinship by Covenant, Dr. Khan does an excellent job revealing what covenants 
were in the ancient Near East, how they were formulated, what constituted them, and he looks at it from a biblical perspective and, and kind of shows um, how each covenant was, was set up and then goes into the New Testament and starts explaining how things are, have, have disappeared, have uh, been either fulfilled or um, have been done away with. But when you think of this word canon, over time both parties would add the canon. Basically what the canon is, is it's a history of how the two parties walked out this covenant. So if, um, if two kings would enter into a covenant with each other, two kings of two kingdoms would enter into a covenant, what they would do is they would write down the covenant and they would sign it and each party would have their covenant. It was legal, it was binding, and they were obligated to fulfill their portion of the covenant. But then what they would do is they would give to the scribes and all of the people who were re, uh, given the responsibility to document life of that kingdom, you would have things added to the canon of the covenant. And what the canon of the covenant would include would be things such as the poetry, art, music, the culture that was formed over time. You might include what life was like shortly before the covenant was signed and then what life was like shortly after the covenant was signed. That was common. Uh, and when we think of things such as the Ark of the Covenant, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later when we get to the Mosaic Covenant, but the Hebrews were not the only culture that had an Ark with their covenant in there. That was actually a historically, contextually relevant thing for the Israelites to have. So having an ark or some type of box that the covenant that two parties would sign would go into it, and then having things about the culture that would go in would go into this. It's, it's very similar to in our day and age where we have keepsake boxes and we're like, this is the life of little Billy. And these are his foot when he was born and we stamped his feet. And then here's his first, you know, picture that he wrote. And here's one of his report cards. And you would have like the life of, of, your, of your child in this little keepsake box. Well, it was very similar to what parties, kingdoms would have when they would grow into an agreement with each other. They would have these, these covenants and these arcs. So a canon, what is a canon? Well, a canon... Now don't put two ends in your notes because a canon with, well really three ends I guess, a canon with two ends in the middle is like you know the canon you know, that shoots things. But a canon is a body of literature. So this might start to make sense when you start looking at what are the five major covenants in the Bible, all right? So I'm going to draw a circle, all right? And I'm going to draw five of them here. I think this is actually quite funny because these pictures you're going to see here actually look like you're staring into the nozzle of a cannon, even though we're talking about cannons. Anyways, so you have Noah or the Noahic covenant, you have the Abrahamic covenant, you have the Mosaic covenant, you have the Davidic, it's not a P, it's a D, Davidic covenant, and then you have the covenant with Jesus. All right, so if we were to fill these little things in here, these are the covenants. This is the binding contract, if you want to say. This is the covenant. And what surrounds these covenants is the canon. So the canon is going to surround 
these covenants. Because what surrounds the covenant is a body of literature that explains life as it was with that covenant. So with this perspective, it helps us understand, if I hadn't erased it, all of that information about the Bible chronology and the books of the Bible, simply because if you read it just from beginning to end, you start to not understand, well, what covenant? What canon? What part of the canon am I reading when I read the book of Job? What canon? What part of the body of literature? If, if the Bible is just this big, long, written account of God's covenant journey with mankind, you grab a book, you grab a scripture verse, the first question you ask is, what canon is this referencing? And what is that covenant? Now, with that being said, the effects of some of these covenants last longer than others. Because some covenants have promises that have been fulfilled, depending on where you're reading it, right? Some covenants have ended completely, which makes you say, wait a minute, I thought God gave everlasting covenants. I thought his covenant. So some of these have ended, and some of these began at different points in time. So that is, uh, is how you want to look at it. So... To, to give an example, uh, I'm going to give one example in, in the Bible of how we can get confused if we don't know where in the Bible we're talking and what covenant we're in, and then we're going to start with the Noahic covenant, and we're going to go, this is kind of like a Bible study class, so we're going to be able to crack open our Bibles and read some scriptures and look at some things, because I know that's what we want to do anyways. But So... So we're going to end the day on the Noahic Covenant, and that's all we're going to focus on. But I want to talk about something that is pretty important, and that is this word right here. Wrath. Wrath is a not-so-fun word. Um, and I'm kind of doing this because pa Pastor Bob kind of put me on the spot on one of his messages a little while ago. He said, I will let Chris help you figure that all out. Okay, so not necessarily what you believe right now, but what are some things that you have heard about the wrath of God and how God um, is either supposed to or how, you, how have you heard or when have you heard God has poured out his wrath or what releases God's wrath. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Like, what have you heard? Like, when does God pour out his wrath? Sin. On sin? The flood? You said the flood? Okay. Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay. Um, the thing that Bob was kind of like coming against was this theology that God poured his wrath on Jesus on the cross, right? And then there's more wrath to come because then you read Revelation and it's like, you better get saved because you never know when God's gonna pour out his wrath. The bowls will be tipped. Anybody study Revelation? And you have the bowls are gonna be tipped and God's wrath will come furing up. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these things. Um... From Genesis 1 to Exodus 19, that period of time is all before the law. It is all before the Mosaic Covenant. All right? The law had not been put out. Prior to Exodus 20, there is 
no mention of wrath. None. Now, think for a second. Because two of the examples that were just given of when did God pour out his wrath was Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood. But if you read your Bible, you will not find the word wrath related to either of those two. The first time wrath is mentioned is in Exodus 22. And it's, that's two chapters after the law has been introduced. So not long after the law has been introduced, in Exodus 22, there is a scripture verse that talks about taking care of widows and orphans. And if you don't, you will feel my wrath. That is the first time social justice, violating the law and taking care of widows and orphans is the first time that um, you hear it mentioned. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, there's no wrath. So let's get our Bibles. Open your Bibles to Genesis 18. So close in the beginning, it's like I feel like I'm going too far. Okay, Genesis, Genesis 18, 20 to 21. Then the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. So when it comes to Sodom and Gomorrah, he is responding to, I said an act of justice earlier in 22, and that's not really the case. That's in dis disobedience to the law. This is where the social justice comes in. There was a cry coming up to God, and we had talked before about does God know everything? Does he ever change his mind? And this is an example where it says, the cry is so grievous that I'm going to go down and check this out for myself. And if it's as bad as they say, then I'm going to act. So this is a righteous justice act. He was responding in justice. He wasn't responding in wrath. He was responding to the cries that were coming out to him. It was an act of justice. No wrath is mentioned. You go to the flood, Genesis 6.6, 6, what's God saying there, Genesis 6, 6, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. No wrath, but he was grieved and he re uh, regretted making mankind so he decided to have a fresh start. No wrath, but he was grieved. His heart was broken. No wrath. And this makes a little bit more sense because if Exodus 20 is where the law is released and Exodus 22 is the first time that we hear the word wrath, and even in the Hebrew, if we look at Romans 4, verse 15, because law brings wrath. Law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. Where there's no law, there's no wrath. Law brings wrath. When we start talking about the Mosaic Covenant, you're going to realize that the law and the Mosaic Covenant, the way that it was established, was not God's heart at all in the first place. 
It wasn't what he wanted. It wasn't what he desired. He desired that the nation of Israel would be a nation of priests that would act as liaisons to represent and reconcile mankind to God, and Israel rejected that. And because they rejected that, they said, Moses, you go up, you just go talk to God and just give us the rules, and we'll just do what you say. And therefore, a system of law was set up. But the law brings wrath because it exposes sin. So so even with a proper chronology, we kind of miss a lot. And uh, we consider it as like one long story, then we have some challenges. So let's, we're doing good on time. I'm so happy that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Abraham talks him down. That's right. Almost nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if there were just 12, I think it was. Maybe, right. Uh, right. Then he wouldn't do it. Didn't he get down to, either got down to 10 or 5. Do you remember? Is it 10 or 5? Actually, 5, I if, thought so. If each of his children had evangelized one person. <laughs> it would have been done good. Which kind of cracks me up when I hear people say that the, um, they believe that God is going to pour the wrath, his wrath upon the United States because we're so evil. But I think we might have at least five righteous people in the United States. So we should be okay. So if that was the case, we should be okay. But <laughs> Okay. I'm not going to put this all on the board. Um, write this down. So here's the canon of the Noahic Covenant. All right. Why are you starting with Noah and not doing Adam? Adam was really wasn't a covenant by the way that the um, most scholars take it. I mean, Adam and Eve were basically created and they were created to be sons and daughters. It really wasn't a covenant, it was just you are. You are created. There was no covenant that was established. There was no, I'm gonna put you in and here is my covenant with you. There was no actual language that states that a covenant was in effect. Now, to your defense, there are some scholars that point out that it was a type of covenant that basically was dissolved right from the get-go. But if you use some of the ancient Near East understandings of how a covenant was actually formulated, there isn't enough evidence in scripture to call it actually an official covenant. So there was a promise, there was a instruction for them to do, and there were some you know, rules to be put into place, but there's some missing elements to the sign of the covenant. You know, there wasn't, for one, there was no blood shed in anything that would have to do with an Adamic covenant. So that's one aspect of things. So we're going to actually start with the Noahic covenant. And we could say that the canon begins with Genesis 1. Oh, we'll put these up here. And these are basically based on, I'm just going to put Genesis up here. And I'm going to put 1. And these are chapters. Chapter 1 is the seven days of creation. This is where the covenant begins. Two, chapter two, is you have creation in detail of humanity. And you have the Garden of Eden. Then you have humanity's fall in chapter three. Four, you have Cain and Abel. Five, you have the lineage, Adam to Noah. All right? So, uh, six, wickedness, Noah and the ark. Actually, you have wickedness, Noah, 
and then the promise of the covenant. Now this is interesting because in chapter six, the covenant is not established, but the promise of the covenant is given with instructions for what Noah is supposed to do. So then seven, you have inside the ark. All right. Eight, landing, and then the coming out. And then nine, you have the covenant. This is kind of funny. God has his covenant is officially given to Noah. So how does Noah respond? Noah gets drunk. This is why people who uh, have the filter of dispensationalism talk about how with every dispensation, humanity fails. Because you have a lot of that. You have a lot of failure in humanity in these things. Ten is going to be the lineage of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I always thought Japheth was a cool name. Don't you want to name your kids Japheth? You want to have another one? Name? They have a son? (laughs) A dog. <laughs> and then 11 is the Tower of Babel. Teddy, you'll have a great I hope so. I want a grandson so bad. And then you have the lineage of Shem to Abram. All right. So this right here, this is the canon of the Noahic Covenant. This is the body of literature that is used to represent the canon. So you see that the promise of the, of the covenant is in the middle. All right, covenant is actually finalized towards the end. But well before even the promise of the covenant, you have all of the history that lines up to it. All right, so all of this, and then after the covenant, it continues uh, until the end. And you can pretty much say the end of chapter 11 is going to be the end of this particular covenant. So... What we're going to do is we're going to talk about some aspects of this covenant so that we can understand the Bible in some interesting ways. All right. So, yeah. Was there any, I can't recall, was there a timeline for that number of years that span? Wasn't it 20 Um. When I was reviewing the book in the notes, I didn't see that in there, but I do remember him talking about not just how many years were in the Genesis and then the Old Testament and then the New Testament, but I think he may have done it based on covenant too. I'll have to go check my notes on that. But there are a lot of years here. <laughs> From Genesis to Abram, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. So um, I'm going to have to erase this. Everybody good? Okay. So let's talk about the Garden of Eden for a second. This kind of will help understand some interesting things. Okay. Genesis 2, 8 to 14. We have a detailed view, uh, view of the garden. So in Genesis 2... This is what we have. Starting at verse 18. Wait a minute, is this right? No, that doesn't. Is that right? Oh, I'm doing 18. Okay, yeah. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It's winds through, it winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. 
It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris and runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So that's all familiar, right? All right. So in that account, basically what we have is we have Eden, right? Now it says that a river flowed from Eden to the garden. So the land is not the Garden of Eden. The land is Eden. There was a garden in the land of Eden. Okay? So we don't just have the Garden of Eden. We have the garden in the land of Eden. Because it says, from Eden, a river flowed. Then, once that river, this is very common. You have a very lush land here. So from this river that's flowing down from Eden to the garden, it then breaks out into tributaries. And you have four rivers. And it then so they're not tributaries. Huh? They're not tributaries, they're outflows. Oh, they're outflows. You know your topography, I'm sorry. I'm using the wrong language. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> right? right, right, exactly. So, For spring. <laughs> so you've got them, right? You've got, I'm just going to list them here. You have the Kishan, was it the Gihon? Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Then you have the Euphrates, the Tigris, right? The Tigris. Mm -hmm. And they go to different areas. So you have these different left, different places. Now, we could also say that, let's, let's just move these rivers for a second. All right. So when the fall took place and Adam and Eve were sent away, it says they were sent away from the garden and they were sent eastward. And your, your angels, right, with the flaming swords, right, were on the east side of the garden. So they were cast out, and they were sent off to the east, because it says east of the garden was the angels with flaming Swords guarding the entrance to the garden. All right. You want me to put the names of the rivers? Sure. Sure. I'll do that for you. So you have the, the Pishon, the Gihon, you have the Tigris, and you have the Euphrates. Now, if you were to look at a map, I might have these these rivers in the wrong place. Okay, you're not correct. All right. What you're going to find throughout Scripture is a common theme. And that is when man is traveling east, they're traveling away from God in rebellion. Anytime you have somebody traveling east, they're heading away from God. Anytime you have somebody heading west, they're heading back towards God. And you can see that in a couple of examples in, uh, in Scripture. Um, so going east, not only Adam and Eve, but Cain, when Cain was cast out after killing his brother, he went east. Lot when he chose, was given his land, he chose to go east, away from God. When Israel was sent away in exile, they were basically sent east, away from God. Heading west, you headed west into the promised land. When they were leaving the, the wilderness, they headed west into the promised land. When they would come back from captivity, they were heading west from being in captivity, going back to Jerusalem, back into the promised land. Even the wise men traveled west. So
so that they could find Jesus, who the tree of life is a foreshadow, a type of shadow of Jesus. So the wise men were heading back towards the garden, back towards the tree of life, heading west, back towards Jesus. You see this all throughout. And who here is a Michael W. Smith fan from way back in the day? Anybody? Way back. Way back. Right? Remember his song, Go West, Young Man? Go West, Young Man. Go West, Young Man, let the evil go east. Go West. This is a common, this is not anything new, but it's just an interesting little thing. So, that's what part of this class is. We're not, this is not necessarily saying, hey, this is, you know, you can you can understand this through the canon of the Noahic Covenant, but we're gonna do some just some Bible study. Which way is it? The Muslims face when they face east. They face east. And their backs sort of interesting. That's an interesting thing. All right. So after all this, we good? Can I figure this down? Everybody get their pictures? Satanist worship, Satan of the East. Oh, that's so amazing. You see, it all fits, doesn't it? It all comes together. Uh, so, Cain and Abel. Now, when we were talking about some Calvinism, right? And we were talking about the tulip. Who remembers the tulip? And the T stood for total depravity. And that was basically saying that uh, the original sin comes with every birth. Every child is born with original sin. So here's some things that we can use to combat it. When you look at Cain, the story of Cain, um, it says that when, when God is confronting Cain, he says that sin is crouching outside your door. All right? Now, there was no law yet, but it was after the fall. So, either Cain already had sin inside him, or it was outside him, and he had a choice that he could make. So that's just one example of how you can use something that's in this Noahic covenant to basically ex explain where is sin. Now, if there was no law, where was sin? Well, some people like to use Romans 12 to kind of defend this doctrine of original sin. So let's go to, I mean, not Romans, Romans 5. So if we go to Romans 5, starting at verse 12. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. So it sounds like, right there, they use that verse and they say, See, through Adam, sin has entered. And they interpolate that to say, sin has entered the world, sin has entered every human being because of Adam. Sin is there. From the day you're born, sin is there. But we also have to remember that Adam and Eve were given... A responsibility. They were given the responsibility to not only do what? To grow and multiply, but they were also given the responsibility to subdue the earth. They were the care holders of earth. They were given the authority and the responsibility to take care of the world. So you could say if this is the world, right, and you've got little, you know, different, you know, those, those are my continents. All right. Good job. Looks like a weird part of marble. And then you have, you know, Adam here. There's Adam. Because of Adam's uh, fall, sin was given an opportunity to enter the world. Sin is now. <clears throat> in the atmosphere of the world, all right? And his authority over the world at that point was taken away and was given to Satan. Satan basically stole the keys. He deceived Eve, deceived Adam, and he <clears throat> took away the authority that Adam had to subdue the earth 
and because of his actions, sin entered the world. Now, death already existed. There's a lot of scholars that talk about whether or not <coughs> what, were Adam and Eve afraid of dying? Were they already immortal? Were they not immortal? We could go into a long conversation about that. I have my points of view that might differ from other people's points of view on that. However, we know that the system of life and death had to have existed because that's the only way that plants could reproduce. It's the only way that animals could reproduce. They were designed in a certain way to be able to act. So there was still a cycle of growing, birthing, living, and dying. Um, but that didn't apply, according to Dr. Welton, to Adam and Eve. But death as, as a... Uh, is, is a whole system, it then ended up, because of sin coming into the world, it reigned over the entire world. So things changed at that point. And the way that death reigned through the world was the result of Adam allowing sin into the atmosphere of the world. Now, every person at some point will rebel against God, that's just an inevitable point <coughs> because sin had entered the world. So there's a point in time where everybody makes a choice. Are you going to choose to sin or are you not going to choose to sin? So if we read the rest of this Romans 5, it actually kind of puts things into interesting perspective because it says after verse 12, For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. So even before Moses, it's saying, even though sin was in the world, in regards to mankind, sin was not placed under their account because there was no law. Until they chose to disobey God, because they still had an opportunity to interact with God. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who do not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But, in verse 15, the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift is not like the result of the one man's sin, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? It's interesting here because if you study atonement theory, in atonement theory, atonement theory is a study of what actually took place on the cross. What did Jesus actually do for mankind on the cross? And there's all kinds of theories. There's one theory that's called Christus Victor. And this theory of atonement basically is saying <clears throat> Satan deceived man, Adam, and through one man, sin entered the world, bringing death, and Adam surrendered the keys to Satan. Christus Victor atonement theory says that just as through one man, sin came, through one man, life came. In Christus Victor, Jesus basically redeems mankind, takes the authority away from Satan by conquering sin and death, and takes the authority and gives it back from Satan into the hands of mankind. So that once again, they can multiply, grow, and subdue the earth. 
and give that responsibility back to mankind. So Christ as victor is a little bit different. If you remember, I was reading from the four views of the atonement, and I read about the cosmic aspect of Christ as victor is ontologically superior than the soteriological aspect of the atonement, basically saying that on a cosmic level, what Christ did for mankind as a whole has a higher position than just salvation alone. Salvation is part of that, but on a cosmic level, Christ as victor is talking about giving the keys back to mankind in replacing their level of position as sons and daughters that are given the charge to redeem mankind. It's a huge deal. It's a much better news. So, just an interesting way to look at some things. Okay. Let's move on from here. You know, Chris, when you talk about Victor, uh -huh. uh, it seems to me that that has uh, everything to do with um, the the victory over sin instead of the covering or the satisfaction of yeah. the head. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's a completely more cosmic approach. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. It's a, and, and again, you, you can read that four abuse book and you can believe in Christ as victor right away. And then you get to the next chapter and you're like, well, I need to make some good points. And you start mm -hmm. going to some other things. So we're going to have some fun here. We just got a few more minutes. I'm not going to keep too long. But let's just, um, let's finish with this. So this is going to be fun. The lineage of Adam to Noah <clears throat> is pretty, pretty cool. Because you start talking about names. Our names, uh, Bob Muncy is a real big believer that our names are not by accident. The names chosen by our parents for us are not by accident. We can see time and time again, they'll pull up somebody's name and the meaning of it and read the meaning of the first, the middle name, and it ends up being like spot on. It's like, oh my goodness, that's this amazing thing. So the de genealogy from Adam, so if you want to write these down, you have Adam, then you have Seth, and then you have Kenan. Oh no, not Kenan. Sorry. Yeah. Enoch. Sorry. Somebody knows he's memorized. Oh, she got the book. Enosh. Kenan. Mahalale. I think that's right. Yeah. Jared. Not for subway. Enoch, Methuselah, you know what Methuselah is? Yeah. And then Noah. Okay. So if you're writing this down, great. If you just want to see it, it's going to be interesting. So, Adam, now this is all from, Dr. Welton got this from, a scholar who's done lots of research on the meaning of Hebrew names. So this is not just a, a fun little whim. There's an entire uh, academic scholarly book that you can read about the meaning of names. And this is where it comes from. Um, Adam means man. It's self-explanatory. The name Seth means appointed. The name Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalala means the blessed God. Jared means to come down. Who would name their kid that? It's like, come down! <laughs> to come down! Enoch is teaching. Yes, it is that Enoch. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Yeah, that's a great 
Okay. Now, Methuselah was a contemporary of Noah. Methuselah was alive right around the time before the flood took place. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Methuselah was thinking, you know, my name means his death shall bring, and, you know, <laughs> my you know, grandson is telling me that he's building an ark because God's going to destroy the whole world. Mm. And my name means his death shall bring. Makes you one wonder, just like, what was he thinking in his long, long life, right? Because he wouldn't want to know. And I meant this to Mary. And then Noah means rest. Now, on their own, they might not mean too much to you. But let's read the genealogy from Adam to Noah. And it says, Man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God to come down, teaching his death shall bring the weary rest. Yeah. That's really cool. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, just just we'll read it again. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God to come down and teaching his death shall bring the weary rest. That's just that's powerful stuff. Wow. You start talking about genealogies, it just really gives credence to the fact that. Even in the midst of what he was uh, dealing with, with the fact that the fall took place. And from that point forward, they were going to work hard and toil, and childbirth was going to be difficult, and you know, all of these things. But here's his promise that's being outlined all through the genealogies. We could do more. We can talk about the flood and the promise of the covenant being, you know, revealed. Um, we can talk about, uh, you know, the Tower of Babel is kind of interesting because during the Tower of Babel you had these people who wanted to be a great nation, but they didn't want to do it God's way. They wanted to do it their way, so they wanted to build these great structures and they wanted to be a unified, great people that were rebelling against God. So what was God's reaction? Well, God's reaction was to scatter them and give them multiple languages so they were confused and didn't understand each other. He compared that to two things. He compared that to Abraham, who was a man of faith, and the promise given to Abraham was, I will make you a great nation. They wanted to be a great nation, but they were disobedient and against me. You have faith. I see your faith. I will make you a great nation. And then you fast forward all the way back, or all the way forward to Acts 2, where he ends up stating in Acts 2 that um, he, he gives them a, a, uh, a, uh, the ability to, to come together and purify their lips so that they can be, an, once again, a great nation. So, just a lot of, you know, things going forward and back, but, but that's, again, this is, this is probably the easiest of all the covenants to kind of talk about, because really it's more history than anything, and some of these are just some interesting little theological things that you can use and some nice fun stories. But as we continue next week, we'll dive into the uh, Abrahamic covenant. Yeah, that, uh, Jared, I looked at this before, it also, to come down, can also be translated as lower. Or make love. So the rest of the same made thing. Himself, but no, he made himself love. That's what I mean. Oh, right. himself, you know? Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. That it fits right in there, yeah. you know. So it's good. Alright, well, drive safe. It's crazy rainy out there. Just be blessed. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to come see me.